Hello and welcome into this new video lesson. I am Igor Smirnov, International Grandmaster and the Chess Coach, and the lesson is called Blitz Champion Part 2. Recently we conducted an online Blitz tournament, RCA Open 2013, and before I begin the lesson let me thank you for letting me know about your results and impressions from the tournament. I read all, your, all the comments that you left and it was interesting for me. Before this tournament I recorded a video lesson with some tips regarding a blitz play. If you haven't seen it yet you can find the link below this video. After the tournament finished I have went through the games, mainly through the games of the tournament winners, trying to figure out what are the main factors that determine their success. Now it's my pleasure to share my discoveries with you. From this lesson you will know what are the most important things that you need to implement in your play to become a really strong Blitz player. Although it seems like there are a lot of factors that may affect the result of your game. I was able to narrow down the list down to two elements that are the most crucial. And now let's have a look. Here is the first one. The stronger Blitz players constantly create problems for their opponents. Let's have a look at some examples. This is a game of the player who won the tournament in the end. He played white. Now you can compare your style with the style of this player. It is white's turn. How would you play here as white? Of course white can castle. This is a totally normal and very natural move, perhaps the best one. However, in Blitz you want to be more aggressive, you want to put pressure on your opponent, force him to think and try to embarrass him. With that in mind, White played knight to g5. White is attacking the pawn on h7 and potentially is ready to create some other threats on the king side as well. Of course there is nothing very dangerous for black, he can play h6 or g6 and nothing bad happens to him. But nevertheless, black is now forced to think, he can't play quickly and unthinkingly and there is a very good chance that opponent will do something incorrectly. In the actual game black played a bad move knight to g6, knight is misplaced here and white can continue putting pressure on black. White played queen h5. You can see that in general the white play is pretty simple. He's just moving forward towards opponent's position and creating some threats. Black played bishop e7, but it fails to pretty simple tactics. Knight takes e6 and then bishop takes g6 check. Black can't take the bishop because the pawn is pinned and white gets a mature advantage and a winning possession. You can see that white was able to win the game from scratch just with a few pretty simple and standard attacking moves. Anyway, it works very good for blades. Here is another game. The white player is still the same. It's the tournament winner and you have another chance to test yourself. It is white's turn. How would you play here as white? You know the general idea. We want to create problems for black, put pressure on him and make him thinking. That said, there are only two options. White can attack by playing knight g5 or queen c4. Both moves are possible, but probably queen c4 is more unpleasant for black after Knight g5, black can protect the pawn in different ways. For example, he can go knight d8 and there is no direct way for white to renew his threat. Well, black is ready to push the white's knight back. If we compare this variation with an option queen to c4, in this line white is not only attacking the pawn, but in addition to that he is putting a pin on black's knight and black can't play knight d8 anymore. Black replied queen to c8. White made another attack and move knight g5. See, it's pretty similar with the previous game. White is starting the attack with this move. Black played knight d8, which is the only way to protect the pawn. 
by trading queens and went forward once again with bishop b6, trying to eliminate a defender of the pawn and capture it then. That's what happened in the game, because black has no way to stop it. That's why after an exchange on d8 and knight takes e6, white took the pawn and got an advantage, although the position is still complex. You can see that in these two games the style of playing of the white player was very similar. He went forward, tried to attack opponent's weaknesses and create problems for him. This time we'll be playing black. It is black's turn right now. What do you think? How would you play here as black? There are a lot of ideas that black may try. He can transfer the queen somewhere to king side, maybe push the f pawn after king h8 or something else, knight e7. There are a lot of options for black. In the actual game, he played the most aggressive move e4. Black is trying to close a long diagonal for white's bishop, and after that, black is ready to install his bishop on a 3, queen h3, and he simply want to mate the white's king in a few moves. Black is sacrificing a pawn, and it doesn't look like uh, white is defenseless. All his pieces are pretty active, and there should be a defense. Nevertheless, in Blitz, such risky ideas work well pretty often, because when you play like that, your opponent may be scary, uh, he sees that you're going to mate him, and very often it leads to timid decisions. For instance, in this game he played Queen d2, which is of course very passive and uh, is not re refuting the black sacrifice in any way. Uh, actually, there was nothing very dangerous for white, he could simply take the pawn, if black tries to continue with this way and then bishop f3. In fact, queen h3 is not even a threat, because white can go knight f4. I'll play any move for white, just to see the, this position. If black tries queen h3, white has knight f4. Counter-attacking black's queen and covering the g2 square. Black is losing here. Anyway, in the actual game, it did not happen. And, as we have already seen, white played another move, passive move, queen d2. Let's come back to that position. In this position, after e4, white played queen to d2. Black continued with his plan, bishop f3. White took the pawn, then rook takes e4. Pawn takes. Here black realized that queen h3 doesn't work, because of the same move knight f4, and black played g5, which is another risky decision, but black has no way back. Knight d4 followed, black answered knight e5, and after knight f5, the black's attack failed. Now the d6 pawn is hanging, he played rook to d8, white were able to trade off the queens, and of course this position is winning, white has a lot of extra material. Nevertheless, the game continued. Rook c1, f6, preventing the back rank mate. h4, and here it's important to notice that even in this position, which is objectively losing for black, black kept creating problems for white, and white started to make mistakes. Like in this position, white played knight to g4, it was possible to take first, and to break black's pawn structure. Anyway, he played knight g4, black took the pawn, then played king g6, he is going to play king f5, and push away the white's knight. White played knight h2, although it was not forced in this particular position. Then black played king h5, this is an additional resource that black has in this position. With the White's knight on g4, it would not be possible because f6 pawn would be hanging, but in this position it works. White played rook d1, trying to offer an exchange of the rooks, but it's not what black wants. Black wants to complicate the position and to keep creating threats. That's why he played rook g7 check, king f1, rook to g2, and 
pure white blade a bad move f3 and there is still nothing so much dangerous for white but he started to play wrong moves f takes then bishop takes e3 attacking the rook and after that black played bishop f4 the black's idea is that he wants to play king g4 and somehow try to create a mating net around white's king. Ideally, black would like to place his king on f3 and the bishop on e3, and in that case it will become really tough for white. Ultimately, black even won this game, although he was in a completely lost position. It just proves how it is important to always create problems for your opponent. It works well when you are an attacker, and it works well when you're a defender, when you're a down material, you want to complicate the position and make your opponent's task as difficult as possible. From the practical point of view, it's better to be down a piece in a complex middle game position rather than being a pawn down in a pawn end game. Let me illustrate what I mean. I have created this position just for example, simply to illustrate my idea. In a pawn and game like this, any decent player can win it very easily for white without spending any real time. Now white can play all his moves completely unthinkingly and it's totally obvious what he's gonna do. White will play f4, probably bring the king to the center, then will start advancing his queenside pawns, will create a pass pawn there, the black skin will be distracted, because It'll have to go to the queen side, and at this moment, white white's king will go to the king side, will capture black's pawns, and white will promote his king side pawns. It's solely obvious what to do here for white, and again, any strong player will do it, you know, just in a few seconds. And if you play with an increment, it's possible to win it for white even when you have two seconds on the clock. But if you have at least one second increment, uh, there is no problem at all. That's why when you're down a material, you should try to complicate the position and avoid exchanges. On the contrary, if you're ahead in material, you should try to simplify the position and trade pieces. There was another interesting example about this idea in this recent tournament, let me show it to you. This is a position from the game between two winners of the tournament. White player is the guy who took the first place in the end, and black player took the third place. It seems like white just should resign, and it's totally losing. Although this is true, an interesting thing is that this game lasted for almost 40 moves from this position, and in the end white lost just because of the blunder. <laughs> he actually blundered the bishop. Here you can see how it is important to keep the pieces on the board and avoid exchange when you are a defender. Without the bishops, if we remove the bishops from the board, black will get a simple th theoretical position with a king and rook against a king, and black would win it very easily uh, because he already, know, uh, he already knows the winning uh, plan, how to do that, and he can do that quickly, unthinkingly, just using the ready-made templates that he knows. However, when we added two bishops on the position, black has to think by himself, he already cannot use the template, and this complicates his task a lot. I'll go through a couple of next moves very quickly, and you can see that black is not able to get much progress here, and he doesn't know <laughs> what to do. Although, ultimately, uh, he got something that was close to winning. Okay, I'll skip the moves and we'll come back closer to the end of the game. In this position white blundered his bishop. He played king g1, black took the bishop and white resigned. Uh, without this oversight, you know, white could simply remove the bishop somewhere and it would take it could take a lot more moves for black to win this game. Okay, in blitz games with an increment, probably black would win anyway, although it's not the fact. But if you play a game with a fixed time control without increments for every move, there is a great chance that your opponent will not have enough time to 
uh, deliver a mate. Your task is simply to create problems for your opponent, always think what he's gonna do and try to prevent it. For example, let's think how white should play in this position. Perhaps the most natural way for black is to play rook f2 check. White can't go to e1 because of a discovered check with a bishop. White will go king g1. Then black may try to put the white skin in the corner. And then white is playing like this, king g3. Now you just look at what your opponent is gonna do and try to prevent it. Black is gonna play rook f1, you can prevent it with bishop c4 or even with a tricky move like bishop to g2. Hopefully that your opponent will grab the bishop and th that'll be a stalemate. Black will probably do something else like this. He wants to mate you with a rook a1 check. What should you do now? Once again, just prevent it. As long as you can, you should prevent his plans. You can play bishop f1. And now if black goes rook a1 automatically, that'll be a draw. All of a sudden, black will probably move the rook somewhere. Let's say into d to, to b2 or to d2, trying to wait until you move the bishop and then play rook b1 check. But you can prevent it once again with playing bishop d3. And you can continue the same idea over and over again. You see, it can be annoying for black. And it complicates his task a lot. There is a great chance that it will take much more moves for him to win this game. And ultimately he will run out of time. And uh, will not be in time to mate you. So far we analyzed how you should play Blitz games. And we have seen the great importance of creating problems for your opponent. Now I'd like to show you one example of a failure. And that illustrates what you should not do when you're playing Blitz. This is a game between two tournament leaders. A white player took the second place in this tournament, the black player took the third place. It is the black's turn now. Black got a pretty solid, yet a bit passive position and he decided just to keep his defense. Now let's go through the games quickly. Black is just holding. Rook c8, rook c6. Black doesn't do anything special. And ultimately he made a blunder with knight d7. And after a check and knight b4, black is losing the pawn. And in the end he lost the game as well. You see black tried just to wait and to keep his defense and it was a bad strategy for blitz. In a classical game, I mean, uh, in a long time control game, this strategy is completely normal. But in Blitz, it's not what you want to do, because you want to play more aggressively. Now let's come back to the initial position of this example. Okay, here it is. What should Black do now? What do you think? Black doesn't want to play e5, really, because at some point maybe he'll be able to play d5. Who knows, if white removes one of his rooks from the d-file, this may become possible. I, I think the best idea is to try to expand on the king side, because on the queen side he's blocked, so black may try to play g5 and then maybe g4, trying to undermine the e4 pawn and make it weak. In addition to that, black can push h-pawn to h5 and after that he'll have uh, two threats in mind, he can either push g4 or h4. Of course there is nothing dangerous for white, but anyway, he's disturbing white, he's forcing him to think about black's aggressive options, and that's how you want to play in Blitz games. Create threats, make problems for your opponent, force him to think, and uh, try to frighten him with your aggressive ideas. We've been observing some examples to see this idea in practice. We have seen that strong Blitz players always try to create problems for their opponents. This idea may work in two different situations. In a situation when you are an attacker or when you are a defender. If you have an advantage, if you have stronger position, then you want to attack and create problems for your opponent. If your position is worse and you are a defender, 
In that case, you still want to create problems for your opponent, but in, but in this case, the way to realize this idea will be different. Here you will avoid exchanges, try to create more complex position, and also you'll try to prevent opponent's plans. You'll see what you want to do and will prevent it. That's the way to realize this idea when you are uh, on a weaker side and you have to survive. Okay, so that was the first most crucial idea that can bring your blitz results to the top level. And now let's move on to the second and the last most important idea. Uh, this idea is to avoid blunders. That's the second distinctive feature that differentiated the tournament winners from the other participants of this event. The tournament winners almost never blundered, even though it was blitz games. A lot of people think that in order to prevent blunders you need to solve tactical puzzles. However, it's far from the truth. Well, solving tactical puzzles won't hurt. Maybe it will improve your tactical vision, but it will not prevent blunders. Let me show you what I mean by some specific examples. How would you play here as black? In the game black played bishop b4, putting the pin on white's knight and threatening knight takes e4, although certainly white can go queen a4 and win a piece with a double attack. Black just resigned here. This is a very popular blunderer. I've seen it in a couple of games, including the games of uh, pretty strong players. So you should know it and be careful. At the same time, you can see that it is not really a combination or some kind of tactics that's a pretty obvious idea and black just was, was callous. Okay, let's see another example. It's another game between tournament leaders. White player took the second place in the tournament and black player took the fourth place. Thus, we can't say that they are weak, they are not weak at all. For example, the black player has an official rating around 2650, I think. Anyway, let's see what happened in the game. White played bishop e2, covering his queen and attacking black's bishop. Although at the moment the white's e4 pawn is hanging, white thought that black will have to take on e2 and after recapture the pawn will be protected again. However, black has more powerful decision. He can check first with queen c5 and only after king h1. Take on e4 and this time knight f2 is a serious threat. White cannot ignore it. He played rook f1 and after knight f2 black wins material and he got a winning position and later he won the game. Well, let's come back to the starting position of this example. Here is the starting position again, and as we already know, bishop e2 move was the reason of white's failure in this game. As you can see, it was not a matter of a certain complex combination that black realized. The idea was pretty simple. Most often, if you look at the blitz games, you will see that the blunders that happen there are pretty simple. Very seldom you will see that someone sacrifices a queen and then uh, delivers a brilliant mating combination. Much more often you will see very simple ideas like this. In this game white simply overlooked the black's move queen c5 check. And that was the reason of his uh, failure and of his loss. That's why solving of tactical puzzles will not help you to prevent things like that things that are the most crucial in Blitz. It is not about your tactical vision, it is about a proper way of thinking. When you take into account your opponent's possible aggressive replies and you avoid any situations when you can overlook something. I've recorded a couple of lessons about preventing blunders already, that's why right now I will not repeat all the same things once again. If you haven't seen my lessons about how to prevent blunders, you can find a link below this video and I strongly recommend that you have a look. This is a very important thing. It's really annoying when you play a good game and then ruin it after one careless move.
Now let's make the final conclusion. After observing the games of the tournament winners, we can come to a very easy summary. Although there are many factors that can determine your success or failure in Blitz, there are only two items that are the most important. The first item is that you should always try to create problems for your opponent. And the second thing is that you should avoid blunders. If you implement just these two things in your Blitz play, your results will be very good. And before we finalize this lesson, let me show you a few examples that are just pretty interesting. Here Black played a seemingly logical move knight to f5. How would you play here as white? Yeah, white has a nice combination, bishop g5, taking the queen and then queen to c6 check, eliminating the last defender and rook d8 mate. Just quite a funny final position when white wins the game just with two pieces. Here is another interesting example. Black played here f6, attacking the white's bishop. However, white didn't want to retreat and he played queen c6 instead, counter-attacking black's bishop on e6. Black answered king f7. White continued knight f3, developing a piece, and now if black takes the bishop after knight takes g5, it will be check uh, with the double attack on black's king and bishop. That's why Black tried to renew the threat on White's bishop with a move h6. And White replied with a very sudden move g4. A really a weird game. Can you see the White's idea? Yeah, after Black finally took the bishop, White delivered a funny mate in the center of the board. Okay, it's just a little funny example. If you played in the tournament RCA Open 2014, I thought it would be interesting for you to see the games of the tournament winners and to learn some lessons from them. That's why I recorded this lesson. Hopefully it will be useful for you, especially if you try to implement these ideas in your games. I'm sure you'll see good results. Thanks for your attention. As usual, you're welcome to leave your questions or comments in the special area below the video. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you in the next videos. Goodbye.